Please open your Bibles to John chapter 1. We'll be continuing our study in the first chapter of John this morning. It's good to be back in the pulpit. It's good to have some time away, and it's good to be back with you all now. Um, This morning, we continue working our way through the first week of Jesus' ministry. John has taken pains to lay out the events for us following his prologue as a tight series of days. You'll remember it began with the day the Jews from Jerusalem sent people to question and interrogate John the Baptist, why he was doing what he was doing, and then starting in verse 29, the next day. And that's the day when John sees Jesus coming towards him and points him out and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we spent an entire Sunday just considering that rich phrase. We're picking up now in the second half of that section, of that second day, and we'll go through the third day as well in in sequence. And this morning, we're going to look at the growing crowd of witnesses to Jesus' identity. So in the prologue, John the Gospel writer has told us who this is. This is the Word who was with God and was God. This is God's own fellow, and yet one upon whom the title God rightly fits. He's the only begotten from the Father. He is the one who reveals God's glory, full of grace and truth. He is the one who took on flesh and tabernacled with us. And then John the Baptist witnesses to him. First to the Jews from Jerusalem who are not interested And then to those who come out to receive his baptism of repentance, and he identifies them as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, this morning we're going to see some more witnesses to who Jesus is. Three, in fact, three witnesses, and we're going to consider one question. Three witnesses, one question. I'd like to begin by reading our text and then having a word of prayer. John 1, 32 to 42. Yes, I will try to cover 10 verses on a communion Sunday. Um, We shall see. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for he, it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Lord God, as we consider the testimony of your word and and the many witnesses to the identity of your son, Lord, I pray that you would give us hearts that seek the glory that comes only from you and not the glory that comes from man, that we may want Jesus more than the things of this world, that you would cause them to grow strangely dim in our our own eyes, that he might be glorious and great. We might entrust ourselves to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Now again, I apologize for breaking up this section. Um, Last time we were here, I thought the title, The Lamb of God Who Takes Away the Sin of the World, was so rich, so profound, so pack full of meaning. I just didn't have time to finish John's second witness in the second day. So we're going to pick that up this morning. And then when John again says, Behold the Lamb of God, we're going to move much more quickly, having tarried the first time. So three witnesses to Jesus' identity. The first, 
In verses 32 to 34 is the witness of the Spirit. The witness of the Spirit. Now, it's John's witness, John the Baptist, not John, well, it's John the Gospel writer's witness to John the Baptist's witness to the witness of the Spirit. For simplicity's sake, we're just going to say the witness of the Spirit. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So John, the gospel writer, has testified to who Jesus is. He's told us. Then he introduces the testimony of John the Baptist, a well-known man regarded as a prophet by the people. And we see again and again and again he testified to who Jesus was. Well, part of John's testimony was to tell them about the testimony God the Holy Spirit gave to Jesus. John saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. John's gospel does not contain an account directly of Jesus' baptism, although it's referenced here. Again, John is writing last. He assumes many of his readers are familiar with the events of the gospel narrative. We, we see that even in this text. Look at who, how Andrew is introduced. Andrew is introduced as Peter's brother. Before Peter is introduced as Simon, before he gets renamed as Peter. The assumption is, if I'm trying to tell you who Andrew is, he is Peter's brother. And the assumption is many of his readers would understand who Peter was. And so John can reference Jesus' baptism without narrating it. So as we look through Luke's gospel, we saw the events of Jesus' baptism. He came out, and John the Baptist initially said, no, 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 you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, permit it that all righteousness may be fulfilled. And John relented, and as he baptized Jesus, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descended from heaven. God the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. These are the events John's referencing. So even though John's gospel does not contain an account of Jesus' baptism, it does reference it, and that's happening right here. And John is testifying to the significance that he saw. We know from Jesus' baptism that there's significance for him, encouragement for him. Many of those who were present only heard thunder. This wasn't primarily a sign for those watching, but apparently it was also a sign of confirmation for John the baptizer because he got a lot from it. He saw the Spirit descend from heaven, and then we learn that Jesus was anointed by the Spirit at his baptism. Now, there's a lot of discussion of Jesus as the Christ. And we've previously considered that Christ and Messiah and anointed are Greek, Hebrew, and English for the same thing. Christos, Messiah, and anointed are Greek, Hebrew, and English for the anointed. Well, what exactly does it mean to be anointed? Well, in the Old Testament, when a prophet or a king was anointed, that the priest would come and pour oil over his head. So Samuel anointed Saul as king. Well, that pictures God's true anointing of his anointed one and the spirit descending upon him. And so here, John the Baptist, with this sign, sees Jesus being anointed by the spirit of God. And this links with, if you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 12 I mean, 11, sorry, Isaiah 11. Um, with the identity of the coming one. This is Jesus' baptism, both in water and in the spirit. Isaiah 11, starting in verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root bearing fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Or Jesus' other passes that he, he enjoyed quoting, we saw in Luke, Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. There the, the spirit being upon the prophet is equated with the anointing. The Messiah-ing, if you will, Christosing, to bring good news to the poor, 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. So when you ask yourself, what does it mean Jesus is the anointed? When was he anointed? With what was he anointed? He was anointed at his baptism by the Holy Spirit. And John saw it and he understood. And he's communicating that now to those who will listen to him. Not only does the Spirit anoint Jesus at his baptism, but the Spirit remained, abided on him. And that's significant because in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon various people for tasks God had for them, and then would leave, most notably Saul. In 1 Samuel 16, 14, Saul loses first the dynasty when he offers the unauthorized sacrifice. And then he loses the kingdom itself when he spares Agag and he gives spoil to the people and he makes a statue of himself. And we read these terrible words in Psalm 16, 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, which is why David in Psalm 51, after he's killed a man and stolen his wife, prays and says, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. So unlike all of these other anointed ones, and the Bible can speak of Saul even as the Lord's anointed. That's why David won't strike him down. The anointed par excellence, the true, final fulfillment of the Lord's anointed comes, and the Spirit does not temporarily remain on him, but he abides on him. So John saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. Jesus was anointed by the Spirit at his baptism, and the Spirit remained on him. And that then is what communicates Jesus' identity to John. He says, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. And so we learn the Spirit revealed Jesus' true identity to John. Now, John saying, I myself did not know him, I think primarily means I did not know who he truly was. We considered last time that it's possible John had not laid eyes on Jesus since his childhood or before. But I think that the true implication here is I did not know who this one truly was. John only is aware of and able to make such bold declarations about Jesus, not because he's smarter than the average bear, not because he's put it together, but because God has revealed it to him. He's not taking credit for his knowledge. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's not taking credit for his knowledge that he who comes after me is greater than me, for he was before me. Rather, it's revelation. He's dependent on God revealing his identity to him. And he realizes through this sign that God the Father spoke to him and told him, the one you see this happen to, this is the one who baptizes the Holy Spirit, that Jesus then is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, the word baptize is sometimes unhelpful because we don't translate it. Baptize is just transliteration of baptizo, which means to dip, dunk, or immerse. I like to talk about dunking John. Um, This is the one, he says, who will dip, immerse, baptize with or into the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a reference to the New Covenant passage in Ezekiel 36. Turn turn there quickly, if you will, Ezekiel 36. This is also the text that Jesus is referring to, I believe, in his discussion with Nicodemus. He must be born again. Ezekiel 36, the Lord God makes this great promise. Starting in verse 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations in which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, in which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land and I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. 
And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, to be careful to obey my rules. And you shall dwell in the lands that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. When Jesus tells Nicodemus in chapter 3, you must be born of water and the spirit. You must be born again. I believe it's this passage he's referencing. And there are other passages we could look at Joel 2 and the promise that in the latter days, God will pour his spirit out on all flesh. But the, the point is this. John's baptism was one of preparation. It was one of water. Jesus is pouring, dipping, immersing with the spirit. Now, we know this will occur in its fullness in Acts 2. But even at the end of John's gospel, Jesus will call the disciples, breathe on them and say, receive the Holy Spirit. This is setting up all of that. And for our purposes here, this is more signification that Jesus is greater than John. Jesus is the promised one, the Lord's anointed, on whom the Spirit descended and remained, the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John sums up his testimony. And I have seen and bore witness that this is, now the ESV has, back in John 1, the Son of God. It does have a footnote that I think is helpful. It does have a footnote. Or his chosen And I think narrowly, that's a better reading. Either one would work, and both would be true. It seems more likely that a copyist would take an obscure term like the chosen and switch it back to something much more familiar in John's gospel like Messiah than the opposite. And if that's right, if the blank here is Jesus is God's chosen one, then this is a link to another significant messianic text, Isaiah 42. You know this one. Um. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. He'll bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make his heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. I think by a slim edge, this is probably the better reading, in which case Jesus is being linked with this suffering chosen servant. Remember, on the Mount of Transfiguration, what three titles does God the Father give Jesus? This is my beloved son, my chosen, listen to him, connecting with Deuteronomy 16. So either way, whether it's the son of God, or I think slightly better, chosen, John is testifying to the identity of Jesus. Then we get to the witness of John. So John telling us about the testimony, the revealing of the spirit about who Jesus was. Then we get to John's reiteration of what he said the day before, verse 35 and 36. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the lamb of God. I'll just move quickly here because we spent so much time on that title last time. The next day then moves us into the third day since the Jewish delegation. I suggested to you that this, these days that John lines up are six or seven. Uh, I, I call it a week, but I wouldn't argue about it being six or even eight, depending on how you count them. Um, but what is important is these things happen right after one another. And part of what John wants us to see is the speed with which Jesus goes from an unknown nobody, among you stands one, you do not know, to, look at chapter 2, Verse 2, somewhere between six or eight days later, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. So Jesus, in six to eight days, I'll call it a week, goes from unknown to a teacher with a group of disciples who move with him. And, and one of the things we're going to see even this morning is just how authentic, genuine, how compelling Jesus is. How little time people have to spend with him to have their minds made up. It doesn't take months and weeks and study. Andrew spends a day with Jesus. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. The next day, the third day since the Jews questioned him. And he points out again, behold, the Lamb of God. And again, this is God's sacrificial lamb. Linking back to the uh, Isaac story with Abram. Looking back to the Passover Looking back to the suffering servant of Isaiah, and we considered that all two weeks ago. Which then brings, 
in the midst of these witnesses, first the witness of the Spirit, the witness of John, now to the question of Jesus. The question of Jesus. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now, first thing to consider here is this. Jesus here does not call them. I, I highlight that because Jesus will begin calling people in just a few verses. John is linking the connection here not to Jesus' activity, but John the Baptist's activity. Um, Notice how he begins verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus. John wants us to get at this point. We're seeing the consequence of John the Baptist's faithful witness. Now, Jesus will call others. He will say, come follow me. We're going to see even in this passage, he's going to take ownership of Peter, giving him a new name. But these first disciples, this is the fruit of John's faithful witnessing. John has been faithful as a witness, and the first followers of Jesus come as a result of John's faithful witnessing. They begin to follow Jesus here because of John's witness. Now, Jesus will later call them vocationally or call them full time. Um, They're his disciples, and they go with them to a wedding, but they go back home, or at least some of them do. We know Peter goes back to fishing and to Luke 5 when Jesus sees him in the boat and says, come follow me, which is a t- called a full-time vocational, if you will, discipleship. But here, they, they come because of John's witness. Now, Jesus notices them, and I, I love this. I love how gentle our Savior is, and yet how pointed he is. He doesn't send any away, but he does care about why people come. And he asks them a pointed question. He sees them following him. He looks at me and says, what are you seeking? Now, that's the question, isn't it? That's the question. Now, they don't answer it directly, but I think by their answer, they do give an answer. They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? So, So what are they seeking? They are seeking Jesus. He's not a means to an end. They want to be with Jesus. Where where are you staying? Where are you going? We want to to go there. And presumably that's good for Jesus because he says, come and you will see. So they followed him. But I want you just to consider here, because this is a theme that shows up in John's gospel repeatedly, that why you seek Jesus matters immensely. This is one of my concerns with some of our evangelism. And we put forward Jesus as the one who gives your life meaning, or Jesus is the one who will fix your marriage, or Jesus is the one who will give your life purpose. And that's true to an extent. But if that's the only reason you're coming to Jesus, I don't think that's a terribly good reason to come to Jesus. And John's gospel, t- turn over to chapter 5. It's filled with people seeking Jesus for other things. And Jesus will have no part with them. What's his rebuke to the Pharisees? In John 5, he gets in a conflict with the Pharisees. He tells a man who is lame to carry his mat, and they get upset with him. And, and Jesus tells them why they won't believe. John 5, verse 44. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory It comes from only God. They can't believe because they're not seeking the right thing. They can't believe because what they're seeking is what people think of them, the approval of people. And Jesus says, how can you believe when that's what you want and you don't seek the glory that comes from God? Turn over to chapter 6. There's a whole mob of a crowd seeking Jesus, and Jesus runs away from them. Why? Verse 15, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. They don't give up. Look down at verse 24. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they said to them, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. You'd think that's good. There's a big crowd getting in boats seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them. And notice this. His rebuke to them is on what they seek. I say to you, 
You are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your full of the loaves. His correction to them is, you're seeking me for the wrong. You want another meal. You want some more free bread. You want another magic trick. Jesus tried to avoid these people. So why you want Jesus, why you're seeking him matters. Interestingly, it's the same question Jesus asked the guards who come to arrest him. Who or what do you seek? And so as we consider this this morning, we, we get a good answer here. Notice how low the entry bars. If you want Jesus for the right reasons, he says, come, come and see. He welcomes them, right? So, so the blanks here, why you seek Jesus matters immensely. They desire to follow Jesus and to remain with him, and Jesus welcomes them. Jesus does not welcome people who seek him for the wrong reasons. So you, you can, if you've received the testimony, seek him because he's the Lamb of God who will take away your sins. Seek him because he is the Son of God who is God. Seek him because he's Israel's Messiah and Savior. Seek him because he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Don't seek him because he might give your life an extra boost or some zing. Only. Seek him for who he is. Remember, this gets back to John's purpose in writing. I write these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So Jesus asks that pointed question, and they pass. They just, we just want to know where you're going because we want to go with you. And he welcomes them. The one who is God in the flesh, come. Come, you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. For it was about the 10th hour. It's about four in the afternoon. They're counting most likely from dawn. And so the sun's starting to get low in the sky. And they stay with Jesus. And just imagine the fellowship, the time they had with him. And Jesus welcomes him. I mean, this is the same Jesus who said, I turn none away. I, I say this frequently when we talk about election, predestination, divine sovereignty. Everyone who wants Jesus can have him. No one gets turned away who wants Jesus. What does matter is why you want Jesus. And Jesus is meek and gentle, and he welcomes those who come to him for the right reasons. Jesus welcomes them to stay with him. Which brings us finally to the witness of Andrew. The witness of Andrew. Verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother and said to him, We have found the Messiah which means Christ, and brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now, there's a lot of speculation about who the unnamed disciple is. It's possible it's John himself that would explain how he knows the timing of everything. But we don't know, and he doesn't tell us, so presumably it's not terribly important that we know. There's an unnamed disciple, and there's Andrew. And we get a marking here, again, that John is writing to people who know the story. He introduces Andrew by saying he's the, character, he's the brother of a character yet to be introduced in the narrative. Which only makes sense if you think your readers are aware of who this person is. Who's Andrew? Well, he's Simon's brother, Peter's brother. Who's Simon Peter? Well, we'll find out in two verses. Now, Andrew first found his own brother, Simon. Which could mean one of two things. This could be going back to what we just said. That, In other words, before he even went with Jesus to see where he was staying, he first found his brother. That's possible. I think it's less likely, but it's possible. I think more likely, there's an implied day here, that he spent the day with Jesus, with the other unnamed disciple, and then first thing the next morning, first thing the next day, he finds his brother. E- either way, it is short. He's either spent an evening with Jesus, or he's just heard the testimony of John the Baptist. And and what I want you to get is how compelling Jesus was. There's no hesitation. There's no doubt. There's, hey, maybe we found, we we found the Messiah. We found the Messiah. And I also want you to notice just the significance in this gospel of just being a faithful witness. Just being a faithful witness. Now, Peter, much more well-known than Andrew. We get much more text telling us about what Peter did. Peter's going to go on and and be the head of the church, functionally at least. He's going to write New Testament epistles. But who brought Peter to Jesus? It's Andrew. Just just be faithful and let God 
Let God decide the significance of what you do. You may not be a Spurgeon. You, you may not be a Luther. But you might be the one who brings the words of life to one. Let God decide the significance of what you do. Just be faithful. Here's second generation witnessing. John the Baptist has been faithful to witness. And because of John the Baptist's faithful witness, Andrew goes and follows Jesus. And then Andrew goes and he gets his brother and brings him to Jesus. How glorious is that? He's just being faithful. He doesn't need to have 27 reasons. He just, just come and see him. I, I think we found the Messiah. We found the Messiah. You should come and see him, Peter. Or Simon at this point. It's not Peter yet. It's not Peter yet. Confession. We have found the Messiah. Yeah, Jesus was absolutely compelling to Andrew. Absolutely compelling. And just brings Simon to Jesus. And this is something Andrew does a couple of times. In, in the account in, in, in uh, John 6 with the feeding of the 5,000, it's, it's Andrew who says, well, there's this boy with some loaves and fish. He brings him to Jesus. And later on in chapter 12, <coughs> Listen to this, um, John 12, 20 to 23. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. Now, they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now, Philip doesn't take them to Jesus. Philip takes them to Andrew, who takes them to Jesus. Because Andrew, presumably, is the guy to take people to Jesus. He does that frequently. And what an amazing mark and testimony. Andrew doesn't have many deeds in the Gospels, but the ones he does ring and echo. He was a faithful witness, and he faithfully brought people to Jesus. He brought his brother, Simon, to Jesus. And now we see, at this point, I think John the Baptist is moving off stage. He's going to show up one more time in the Gospel, in in chapter 3, where he's going to tell his disciples who are dismayed, at the, the waning of his star and the waxing of Jesus' star. No, no, no. This is, this is what I'm here for. This is what I'm all about. But now, Jesus is going to become active. Jesus is going to start taking charge. The first two disciples came because the witness of John. The next one, Jesus is just going to call. Look, look at verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Then he's going to see Nathanael under the tree. So Jesus is, is active here. He's beginning to take charge and act. The, the, the camera has lingered on John the Baptist, both to see his faithful, repetitive witness and to see the first fruits of that witness in these first two disciples. But now Jesus utters his first words in this gospel. Our central figure, the word, the lamb of God, the son of God speaks and he takes ownership. He takes ownership. Jesus gives Simon a new name. That's significant biblically. Naming, especially when names connected with who and what you were about, is significant. This is in some sense an act of ownership, an act of authority to, a, to someone beneath you to someone under your authority. And Jesus looks at Simon and says to him, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And this is the, the title, Cephas, which is Aramaic, which in Greek means Peter, rock or rocky. A Greek professor used to say, he's called him rocky. Um, now, none of that wordplay, there is wordplay involved with his name in Aramaic and in Greek. None of that's highlighted here. I think John's purpose in highlighting is Jesus' authority, Jesus' function as a prophet. Jesus looks at Peter, and he sees who and what he is, and he knows who and what he intends to make him. He's your blank. Jesus sees who he is and what he will make of him. That's what's highlighted here. Look, look a little later in, in uh, the next day in 43, right? Uh, Philip, verse 45, found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, um, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? See, Jesus is evidencing a knowledge of people. Go, go over to chapter 2, 
verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them. Why? Because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. We, we see that for the first time here. I think that's, that's what John wants us to get. Jesus meets Simon, and he immediately sizes him up, immediately sees what's in him, and knows what he intends to do with him and what he intends to make of him. This is, this is a biblical prophet functioning. This is someone with supernatural knowledge and authority. And also it marks the shift. If there's any question, these were former disciples of John the Baptist. They're, they're Jesus followers now, as Jesus gives him a new name. That's a mark of ownership. That's a mark of authority. So as we prepare for communion this morning, consider the, the multiplicity of witnesses to who Jesus is. If there's anyone here this morning who's, who's on the fence what to make of Jesus, we've got the, the writer of the gospel himself, John. We've got John the Baptist repeated testimony. We've got the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove testifying to Jesus' identity. Now we've got Andrew, who spent just a few hours with Jesus testifying. We're going to see more and more witnesses to who Jesus is. But the central question that matters, if you're here this morning, to some degree, I'm assuming you're seeking Jesus. What are you seeking? What are you seeking? That's the question. And the good news is if you're seeking a savior, you're seeking a lamb to take away your sin, you're seeking a king, a messiah, a lord, a god to worship, he, he welcomes you to come. He, he welcomes you to this table. If you're come looking for purpose in your life, if you're coming looking for your best life now, or any other lesser reason, I'd encourage you to reconsider and evaluate who this is that you're coming to. John's gospel has, has been absolutely clear on this. This is the Christ, the Son of God. This is the sacrifice that takes away sins, who is himself God in the flesh. And if you would have him come, come, be welcome, and sup with the Lamb of God. Let's pray. Lord God, we rejoice that you have sent for us what we needed, who we needed, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you did not leave us alone in our sins, that you did not leave us on our own, trying to atone for our own wrongdoings that we could never do. And so, Lord, we pray that you give us eyes of faith, that we might see him rightly, appraise him rightly. And just as John required your revealing. We require your spirit's work that we might see him truly. Remove the veil, open our eyes to see, to wonder, and cause us to want, to call out for, to trust in your son for who he is, for what he is, for what he has done, and for no other reason. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.